of the names on our uh, list, possibly the one we're going to do tonight is the less, the, the least um, famous, possibly. Uh, it's certainly true that we don't know a great deal about his personal life. Uh, we know some, and we'll certainly talk about that. And yet his impact on uh, Jewish life and on the halachic process is profound, sometimes overlooked um, for reasons that we will soon discuss as well. So our subject is called uh, Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher, uh, known as Bal Haturim. Uh, he was born in Cologne, Germany, around the year 1275. The truth is that there's no certainty about when he was born. Some say 1270. Um, we don't really know. It's only an approximation. Uh, there's some evidence he was born in 1269, which is probably the most uh, accurate, although, as I said, it may not be definitive. Um, it's not exactly clear when he died either. He flourished in Toledo, Spain. Um, here it says in the uh, page you have in front of you that he died in 1343. Um, some other sources say he died in 1340. Uh, but uh, as I said, um, there is no certainty exactly about that. Uh, he's popularly referred to as the Tour. Uh, he was a halachist, he was a Torah commentator. Uh, he also wrote an eloquent uh, ethical will, which we'll have a chance to consider um, briefly as well, which uh, survives. Uh, he was of great rabbinic pedigree. He was the middle of five sons. And uh, he studied with his father, who was called, uh, known as the Rosh, Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel. Also, his elder brother, called Yechiel, was also a mentor of his. But actually, his renown and his impact has greatly exceeded that of his brother. He had another brother called Yehuda, also quite well known, who left a very um, well known ethical will, uh, also longer than uh, Yaakov Balhaturim in terms of his ethical will. Um, actually, his brother Yehuda, it seems, became the Rav in Toledo after his father's passing. And our subject, it's questionable if he had any official appointment at all. Uh, he lived in Toledo. He was a kind of a private scholar. And as we shall see, his impact on Jewish life was uh, and remains profound. Just a bit of further background and part of why he was uniquely positioned to accomplish something which no one before him had accomplished in terms of halachic writings, halachic literature, and indeed um, halachic uh, authority. And that is that his father, the Rosh, was a leading disciple of another rabbi whom you may or may not have heard of, Maharam Rottenberg, Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rottenberg. And he was renowned as the captive rabbi. He was uh, arrested and incarcerated for years towards the end of his life. And uh, his story is a fascinating one. I don't want to tell you about it now because maybe we'll do another series and we'll talk about him uh, you know, unto himself at that time. Uh, but uh, Maharam Bar Baruch or Maharam Rottenberg, Rameer of Rottenberg, was the, the teacher of the Rosh. And the Rosh wrote halachic commentaries on many tractates of the Talmud. His, but he, the Rosh, fled from Germany to Svarad. And let's begin our, as we've done uh, week by week, uh, to read this very short biographical sketch mm -hmm. and see what we can learn about him in the context of these few lines. Rabbi Yaakov, the third son of Rosh, studied under his father and his older brother, Rabbi Yechiel, on the heels of the Rheinfleisch persecutions. This was bloody massacres in 1298 that blighted life, Jewish life in Germany and Ashkenaz generally. Uh, he and his father fled Germany, arriving in Spain in 1303. It should be 1303. After living for a few years with his brother Yechiel in Barcelona, he moved to Toledo, where his father served as rabbi. So here we see the main factor that enabled Rabbi Yaakov, known as Bal Haturim, to accomplish in the halachic literature what no, one before, which, what no one before him could have done. And that is to draw together the best of the teachings, the most uh, advanced and authoritative and erudite teachings of the Ashkenazic authorities. His father, the Rosh, was one of the Bale Tosafot. Uh, he was heir to the most distinguished rabbinic pedigree and tradition and uh, intellectual um, sort of uh, occurrence of the Ashkenazic world. But because he lived in Spain 
and he came to Spain as a relatively young man and he spent most of his adult life in Spain. He also had access to the writings of Ramban and many of the Sephardic authorities and he became familiar with Sephardic traditions and Sephardic halachic uh, habits. Uh, he quotes Rambam which of course the renown of the Rambam had already spread far and wide but he lived among Sephardim and therefore he was able to bring together in his halachic writings a breadth and a balance which those before him and to a certain degree after him as well were not able to match. And uh, he probably was conscious of that when he undertook the monumental project which we'll talk more about uh, very shortly. Uh, so his father was served as right. In 1329, Rabbi Yaakov wrote regarding Germany, it is forbidden for a person to even traverse a place of mortal danger, let alone to live in the land of blood. Anyone who succeeds in bringing a person out from there is considered as having saved a Jewish soul. It's kind of uh, uncanny how he is anticipating a refrain from 600 years later uh, as well in reflecting on his experience in Germany. He lived in dire poverty. Now, this is quite interesting. It seems that, as I said, he did not accept a formal rabbinic appointment. Some sources, I think maybe the one in front of us actually as well, yeah, claim that um, it says he lived in dire poverty, refused to accept a rabbinical post, preferring studying and writing. After his father's death, he was appointed as judge of the Beth Din in Toledo. It's not completely clear that that was the case. We see that he signed on certain uh, like, uh, decisions of the Beth Din, but he may have just been like invited as an ad hoc member because he was so uh, learned and so uh, respected. So if they wanted to issue a proclamation, they may have asked him to come and sign as well. It's not clear that he really was the Av Beth Din. It seems on the contrary that his, his brother was the, uh, like succeeded his father as the, the rabbi, the sort of chief rabbi of Toledo. Um, and he was, as I said, possibly an independent scholar. Now the evidence for his poverty is interesting. And this actually perhaps is the right time to talk a little bit about his style. And also, I keep telling you how influential he is, and you say, well, why have I hardly heard the name then if he's so influential? The reason is that Rabbeinu Yaakov Bal Haturim undertook a great project which he called the Arba Turim, the four uh, rows. And that project uh, is expressed here, is here in this uh, large volume. I think there are about eight volumes like this, maybe more. I'll just pass it around. It's called Arba Turim. And uh, the, the writing, that is to say, what we call the tour, is in the middle. And you can see the commentaries around it. I'll just pass that to Daniel. And I'll show you this one as well. Because that is the classic one. I don't know when it was first printed. It's, that's a reprint. I bought it when I was in Kolel. But this one was um, published about 20 years ago. It's a great improvement. This one is smaller. Uh, this one is more than 20 volumes. This is volume 20, but it's not the last volume. There may be another one or two volumes in the series. Set. I have a whole set, but I just thought this one was the last, but that's somewhere close. And you can just flip through the pages. I mean, this volume I'm holding is about 500 pages in length. There are 22 volumes like this. So you can see the scope of the project. Now, when you take a look at it, you'll see that there are a number of commentaries written on the tour, of which the most important is the Beis Yosef. The Beis Yosef was written by Rabbi Yosef Karo, and as you probably know, he is the author of the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch, in a way, has um, overshadowed, uh, it has not rendered the tour in any way obsolete, because the Shulchan Aruch is very brief, and we'll discuss that further in, in a moment. But the tour is the basis for the Shulchan Aruch. So the Shulchan Aruch is a, uh, like a summary or a, a condensed version or a sort of brief set of the conclusions that are, that derive from the Beis Yosef, which is a voluminous commentary on the tour. Uh, so again, the tour uh, was written by our our author who died, let's say, in 1340. This commentary quickly became popular. In fact, it was one of the first books, Hebrew books ever published in 1475. 
very, very early. It was published uh, among the first Hebrew books ever to be published. And it's interesting, when the Megurashe Sfarad fled Spain and they made their way, m many of them went to the Ottoman Empire and settled in Constantinople, they brought with them the printing press, the first book ever printed in the Ottoman Empire in Southeast Europe and in the Near East, the first book ever printed is this tour, what you're holding in your hands. That's not, that's, that's of course. Book. The first book ever. The first book ever. No, 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 no. Because they were Muslims, they were not as advanced, and it was the Spanish emigres who brought with them the printing presses and the know-how. The first book ever printed was, was the tour. So it gives you a sense of how influential it was and how popular it was and how important it was. And that's, of course, why uh, so many commentaries were written on it. So Rav Yosef Karo, who was born in Toledo, actually, in 1488, when he grew to, he left Spain four years later in 1492, when he grew to maturity, so he undertook an, a very ambitious project to write an extensive, voluminous commentary on the tour. And he finished it over the course of probably 20 or 25 years. That is the, the main commentary, if you want to open it up to any page, yeah, you'll yeah. see the Beis Yosef yeah. there. That is the main commentary. There are others as well, but that is the most important commentary, the Beis Yosef. And if the tour is long, which it is, Beis Yosef is probably five times longer because you see it's small print and there's so much of it on the page. It was so extensive that by the time he finished it, he realized that it's only the most uh, sophisticated and mature scholar who could study it in its entirety. And to remember it is, you know, only for the, the elite. And therefore he decided to undertake a further project, which he called the Shulchan Aruch, which is the condensation of the conclusions of the Beis Yosef. And because, as um, Shakespeare said, brevity is the soul of wit, not that wit was his objective, but because brevity is always going to be popular, the Shulchan Aruch became the new standard. If we have a further series of bi biographical sketches, it will definitely include Rav Yosef Karo among them. We can talk more about it then. But I, it's worth elaborating a little bit further, firstly to show you how the tour really is the basis for the Shulchan Aruch. The chapter headings and the contents of each chapter in the tour are almost the same as the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch is direct, ba is the, is, that's right, the, the names, Orachayim, Yoredeya, Evan Ezer, Choshen, Mishpat, and the chapter headings, and each chapter, the same number of chapters, it's exactly identical, it follows it very, very closely. Uh, but in addition, whereas the Shulchan Aruch is very brief uh, for the most part, because it's intended only as a summary for the more extensive treatment in the Beis Yosef, which in turn is based upon the tour, as a commentary upon the tour. But the tour is more expansive. It's actually more interesting. The Shulchan Aruch is a legal text. And if you open the Shulchan Aruch, uh, you will be edified, but you will not likely be inspired or fascinated. It's not engrossing. It's a legal text, and it's written in a concise fashion, sometimes a very difficult uh, to, to keep all the different opinions in mind, and that's why the commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch have so much to say. The tour, by contrast, is more interesting. He gives more of the background. He quotes a, a wide variety of opinions, and that is a further reason for his, po his popularity, because he sought to correct the failing that many, um, uh, for which many criticized the Rambam. The Rambam, uh, who we discussed in its time uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, the Rambam doesn't mention the sources for his rulings. The tour always does. He quotes sometimes multiple authorities, uh, Ashkenazic as well as Sephardic, also Ge'onim, uh, also the Talmudic basis for it. The Rambam doesn't do any of that. So, uh, yeah, sure. So, is it, does it only deal with the practical halakha? Yes. Un unlike the Rambam. Yes, that's right. And also another way in which he was different than the Rambam, and in a way more, let's say, accessible, more practical than the Rambam, is that he only deals with the laws which are pertinent nowadays in Spain, that is to say, in the, I mean, he lived in Spain, but he means in the diaspora. So he does not deal with laws of the uh, Mashiach times, doesn't deal with the laws of biblical times, of ancient times. 
doesn't deal with the laws of the land of Israel either, which maybe is a limitation. So like Truma and Maaser and many laws which are practical, especially now in modern times, uh, whether, of course, one lives in Israel or even in the diaspora, it is pertinent. He doesn't deal with any of that. So the Shulchan Aruch also does not deal with those subjects. So in that sense, he's able to like um, uh, focus in a more limited way on the aspects of Jewish practice which are pertinent uh, you know, in, in the current era. Is the Rambam the only one that deals with um, the laws? Like Tuma Tahara and the, the Tzaras uh, and Karbonos, yes, yes, that was part of the amazing uh, novelty and the comprehensive nature of the Rambam's project. Right. Were you here when we did the Rambam? Where did you miss yes, that one? Yes, yes, you were here, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the Rambam is pretty much the only one. The Rif, he doesn't... The Rif also, I uh, don't think the Rif does either. No, the riff is more limited in any case, though. I want to read you a short passage. I've kind of introduced this with my comments about the more, uh, like, elaborate, slightly more personal style of the tour <coughs> compared to the Shulchan Aruch. In uh, chapter, in Orachim chapter 242, which is the laws of Erev Shabbat, the laws of, let's say, um, anticipating Shabbos. It's part of the introductory chapters in the laws of Shabbos. It's in the beginning of the third volume of Mishnah Bura, for those who are working with Mishnah Bura. So he says there that uh, I discussed with my father that someone, as my, I just want to tell you the context of that, of that uh, chapter is where the, uh, he writes that a person who is of very limited means, should nevertheless honor the Shabbos. Even if a person has to skimp during the week in order to provide for himself or his family something a bit more um, elaborate, a bit more luxurious, a bit more uh, you know, of a delicacy for Shabbos, he should do that. On the other hand, if a person is absolutely um, indigent, then about that, the Talmud famously says, Ase Shabbat Cha Chol Ba'al Tistarech Labrios. Make your Shabbos like a weekday and don't be dependent on the handouts of other people. And the Shulchan Aruch goes on to limit that principle and, you know, even the Mishnah Bruce says that the charity dispensers are obligated to provide for the needs of such a person <coughs> so that he can enjoy Shabbos properly. But in extremis, so I say Shabbat Chachol. So it's in that context that we have the following comment in the tour. He says that on a number of occasions I discussed with my father, Kamoni Hayom, someone like me today, Shiesh uh, Li Ma'at Misheli, I have only a very small amount of my own. Ve'eno Maspikli, and it's not sufficient even for my needs day by day. Ve'tzarichani La'acherim, and I'm dependent on the largesse of others. Imani Bechlal Asei Shabbat Chachol. Should I be included in that formula that uh, treat Shab your Shabbat should be like a, week a weekday rather than rely relying on the handouts of, large of the, the largesse of others? He didn't give me a straight answer. He didn't give me a clear answer by way of response. Now, I can tell you, you'll never find a passage like that in the Shulchan Aruch. He doesn't get personal. As I spoke to my father, I'm very poor. What shall I do? Am I included in this category or not? The Shulchan Aruch itself doesn't have anything like that. The tour does. The tour has those kinds of personal reflections. And uh, But that passage, of course, shows his... Um, impoverishment. Um, so that's what it says, he lived in dire poverty. After his father's death, he was appointed judge in the, in the Beth Din in uh, Toledo. Rabbi Yaakov wrote a commentary on the Torah that is an extract. Okay, um, we'll talk shortly about the commentary on the Torah, but let me just say a little bit more about the Shulchan Aruch as well. See, he called, uh, I'm sorry, about the tour. We colloquially call it the tour. The proper name is Arba Turim, Four Rows. And it's based on the um, uh, Choshen Mishpat of the Kohen Gadol, who had a breastplate with 12 precious and semi-precious ge stones, gemstones. And it, ha it was consisted of four rows, four rows of, of three, three stones each. So that's why he called his uh, book the uh, um, Arba Turim. And he divided it into four sections. Uh, Orachaim, Choshen Mishpat, uh, I'm sorry, Orachaim, Yoridea, uh, 
Khoshin, uh, the order doesn't really matter, Khoshin Mishpat and Evan Ha'ezer. Orach Chaim deals with daily laws, it means the way of life. So we deal with daily laws, daily uh, blessings, prayers, also Shabbos, also the festivals in the course of the, of the year, uh, tefillin, tzitzis, uh, we would say uh, religious law in that, in that sense. Yoredea deals with the laws of shechita, the laws of kosher and non-kosher uh, food, uh, the laws of meat preparation, melicha, salting, drawing off the blood, uh, also the laws of lending money at interest are in Yoredea, also the laws of nida, also the laws of mikvah, uh, all of those things are in uh, Yoradeh. Choshe Mishpat is uh, what we would call civil law, laws of damages, commercial law, laws of torts, and that sort of thing is in Choshe Mishpat. And then Evan Ezra deals with marriage laws, about uh, laws re relating to women, marriage, and divorce, also Chalitza, uh, Yibum, and, and those subjects. So those are the four broad um, like books. I read something very interesting, and... Um, I think, firstly, it's fascinating whether it's coincidence or something different. I'll leave for you to ponder. Um, I only found it in one source, and I've got a feeling it's not very well known at all. And maybe this is a good transition to his other work. So he's known to us today as Rabbi Yaakov Baal Haturim. But the name Baal Haturim, for many of us, conjures up a completely different association because he wrote another book which is also very famous. And that is his commentary on the Torah. And... If you turn the page over, actually, you'll see a uh, facsimile of the standard Mikraos Gadolus, and there you can see it's not very clear, but in like the dark outline is what's known as Baal Haturim. So I've got it here. It's printed in, um, well, almost every uh, sort of um, Mikraos Gadolus, every collection of commentaries on the Torah, which has more than just the very basic like Chumash and Rashi, if it's got more than Chumash and Rashi, it will very likely include Baal Haturim. Now, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but I'll just tell you that he wrote another book called, it's known as uh, Tur Ha'aroch. And here's an interesting irony. I mentioned that the Shulchan Aruch is popular partly because of its brevity, even though by the time the commentaries got involved, it's no longer brief, it's not very long. But the Shulchan Aruch itself is brief. He wrote a commentary on the Torah, and he draws on Rashi, Ramban very extensively, uh, Ibn Ezra, Radak, Sadia Gaon as well. This is his commentary on the Torah. He doesn't go into a lot of Midrashic uh, interpretations. He does not go in for Kabbalistic interpretations. And he wrote a commentary on the Torah. This commentary languished for about 500 years. Nobody picked it up. It was first published in the 19th century. He died in 1340. It was nearly 500 years later before they ever published it for the first time. And it was riddled with errors, typing, typing mistakes and everything. It was finally reprinted again, and the, um, like 80 years later. And then finally in the mid 20th century, they reprinted it once more. And I've got it here, Persha Tur Ha'aruch. Now I think they've got a newer, better printing as well. And I saw this, I picked it up in, because I record these things, in 19... 88. And uh, about 20 years after that, I decided I'm going to learn it, which I did. He was my friend for the year some years ago. Very interesting uh, uh, commentary. Not a lot of novelty, um, but still fascinating uh, material. And this is his commentary on the, on the Torah. The only thing is that he had a clever idea, and, and it was more than clever idea, obviously he had a brilliant idea, to introduce each like, section with a few like... Um, you could call it uh, appetizers or a few hors d'oeuvres, you know, something to sort of whet the appetite, something to arouse the interest or the, the fascination of the student. And uh, that became so popular that it was reprinted again and again and again. So that's what you have here in the Macross Godolos. Uh, it's printed here. I'll just pass it around. You can find Baal Haturim. Why do you think um, that language unpublished for so many years? Given what you said about his key work, yeah. and which appears to have been targeted at the masses, and because it was on the, on the everyday things rather than the stuff which wasn't relevant. Yeah. Um, so, so clearly, you know, yeah, the market, it, you said you. it was the first that was published. Thank you. So why, why on that basis was this one not published? And certainly would have not been published until you know, yeah, until modern times. Picked up in the nineteenth century. Yeah. 
um, I think the answer is that it doesn't have that much novelty. He quotes extensively from Ramban, often verbatim, and you can get Ramban separately. Um, the other commentaries that he draws on, again, were, were fairly widely available. And he does quote his father, the Rosh, from, from time to time, and there definitely are, there is material here which is novel. Um, you know, sometimes there's a saying, they say it comes from the Zohar, Hakal Tolui B'mazal Afilu Sefer Torah Shebeheicha. Everything is dependent on luck. Even the Sefer Torah in the, in the Ark is dependent on luck. So maybe if someone had edited it well or had copyrighted it thoroughly and had published it in, you know, centuries before, it would have acquired its own following, its own popularity. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're talking about manuscripts, so maybe the manuscript was damaged or maybe it was destroyed, you know, some of them, and only one or two or three manuscripts survived and they were held by, I don't know, a library somewhere. It's hard to know exactly. It's interesting uh, to... Any time coming vouch, I think, is definitely his because it's been hidden for so long and suddenly... Yeah, form. because it is quoted. We see, well, I mean, it was available in manuscript, right. so it, we find it quoted by other authorities as well. So I think we, we know that it, it is. Also, he quotes his father, the Rosh, he says. Uh, from, so it is apparent that, that it is, it is his, his commentary. It's a good point, though. How can you be sure? But I, I think it's generally regarded as authentic. But the comments on the Torah for which he's very well known, and which is colloquially called Bal HaTurim, are those comments, and we'll see if some of them uh, shortly. Now, the Art Scroll people have produced an outstanding version of the Balhad Turim. I think they've really broken new ground because we'll see some examples of that shortly. There, he's very terse, very brief, uh, very sweet, very uh, insightful. Gematria, Roche Tevos, um, anagrams. Also, he quotes the Masora often, where a certain word, especially an unusual word, might appear in the all of Tanakh in one other place, or three other places, or five other places, and he'll list them. And uh, the Mepharshim will sometimes explain the significance of the fact that this word appears only in two other places, and what, like, links the occurrence of the word here with where it appears in other places. So the art school people have elaborated on that, and uh, they've done really a very excellent uh, job. i just pass that around as well. So if you're looking for a present for yourself, or for a bar mitzvah boy, or if you want... Uh, to give someone a hint that you'd like that as a present for yourself, anyway. So that's something to... Uh, to uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't know if we know which one he wrote first. So uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, but these, what he calls par paraos, the appetizers, I'm trying to give uh, Nuri the, just from the, the handout. Yeah, thank you. Are uh, sometimes so brilliant and so uh, novel. I wonder whether he thought of them all himself, especially the ones that involved quite elaborate calculations, or there were, there were traditions which he had heard, probably some of both. So we we'll look at that more closely uh, in a moment. So I, I was telling you about the, the Arba Turim. So I read that a, a certain man, uh, a rabbi who died in the Holocaust, uh, calculated the, the uh, total number of chapters in the tour. So like Orachaim has, I didn't write down it, but each one has, I didn't have them recorded here, but like Orachaim, let's say, has, uh, uh, can tell you about 600 plus chapters in Orachaim, and um, Choshim Mishpat has about 480 something, and each of the four sections has a certain number of chapters. The total number of chapters is 1,705, and that is the gematria of. Uh, that is the gematria of Yeah, that's the gematria of Orachaim, Yoredea, Evan Haezer, Choshen Mishpat. The combined gematria of those four the names he's given to the four books is equal to one thousand seven hundred five, which is the total number of chapters in all of those four books as well. So whether this is an uncanny coincidence or something he planned, I don't know. I would 
be, tend to think it was deliberate. Mm. It, it would be most remarkable and a strange coincidence for it to be told. Yeah. The writings of a certain man who died in the Holocaust, I don't know if it was ever published even, that observation. So I read it in a published source, but um, it's an interesting uh, observation. So therefore, that's a kind of link between his Arbaturim and the, the work of his, uh, what we call Baal HaTurim uh, Al HaTurim. Let's just finish this short summary now. Um, he prefaced each portion with comments based on gematrias and allusions. These prefaces are printed in most editions of the Chumash under the title Baal HaTurim. His most important work is the Arba Turim. We spoke about that already at length. A summary of all halachot serves as basic text for the state of halacha to this day. It is popularly referred to as the Tur. Rabbi Yosef Kar wrote his great commentary on Beit Yosef on the Tur and pattern in Shulchanach on the Tur system of classifying halachot. And we mentioned that it's limited to the halachot, which are practical and of, of um, current uh, you know, implica- uh, application in the, in the present era. And uh, he distinguishes himself for drawing on the teachings of the earlier authorities, and he cites them by name and quotes them in detail as well. And in this sense, he represents a, a um, step forward, maybe from one point of view, on the style of the Rambam. If you look in the... Um, actually, maybe let's, let's turn the page over right now, and we'll take the chance to look at an example of one of his uh, comments in his Bal, ba, what is known colloquially as Bal Haturim. Oh, did I pass this around? I don't think I did. Did I? No, pass it around. Yeah. So this uh, is taken from the passage in Bereshis where uh, our father Yaakov uh, sleeps and he beholds a vision of a ladder. And the Torah says, Sulam mutsav artsa, a ladder, its feet are fixed in the ground, Varosho magia hashamaima, umalachelokim, and angels of God, olim v'yodim bo. So he has, as we shall see right now, a whole series of comments about the word sulam. Sulam, a ladder, is one of the most, uh, I think, facile symbols in the Torah. And I'd like to begin or preface our review of his comments with an observation which he does not make, but the Ibn Ezra makes it, and that is that the word sulam has the same letters as the word semel. Semel means a symbol. Samach, mem, lamed, semel is a symbol. Sulam has the same letters. So the Ibn Ezra says that the nature of a sulam, whether in a dream or in a work of art or literature, or the Havdil, the Torah as well, is to serve as a symbol. So it's in addition to being a way to climb from low to high, it has great symbolic significance. And let's take a look at a number of different aspects of the symbolism. So taking it from the top, sulama ladder. The gematria of this word, 130, is equal to that of the phrase, ze kise akavod. This refers to the throne of glory. So it's a little observation. Sulam 130 is exactly the same gematria. He's got another one. Sulam a ladder, the gematria of Sulam. Now here he spells it with the Vav. And I've chosen this as an example to illustrate how gematria, some of them are uncanny. But it's also true to say that there's a lot of flexibility built into the gematria system. Uh, I know mathematicians who are a bit leery of gematrias because they know that you can do a lot with numbers. Mm-hmm. And especially the gematria system, we've got Atbash, we've got Mispar Katan, we've got Imha Kolel, uh, and uh, there are a lot of different techniques. You can spell a word, Chaser o Male, like a word Sulam can be spelled without a Vav, but if you want, you can spell it with the Vav. So even though the Torah has it without the Vav, but you can also spell it with the Vav, and you can see there's a going to with the Vav. So that's what he does here. The first one he says, Sulam is 130. But then he says, Sulam spelled with the Vav, it's 136. In that sense, it's equal to kol, which means voice. For the sound of the prayers of the righteous serves a, as a ladder upon which the angels may ascend, which I think is a very beautiful uh, imagery, that the angels are ascending and descending, so the ladder is a, a symbolic of the voice, the call of the righteous whose prayers are like transported to heaven through the agency of the malachim, the angels. This is similar to the incident of the angel who ascended in the flame of Manoach's offering. Who was Manoach? Who can remember? Who was Manoach? We read about him in the Haftarah a few weeks ago. 
a minor biblical uh, personality, but he was the father of a well-known biblical personality. Shimshon. That's right, Shimshon, very good. Shim, the father of Shimshon, Samson, uh, Shimshon, you could contest whether Shimshon is a minor or a major character, but his father Manoach, I think, would be a minor personality. So he offered a, a certain sacrifice, and there was an angel who, like, uh, ascended to heaven in the fire of the sacrifice. For prayer is tantamount to the altar service. Therefore, whoever focuses his intent upon his prayers causes the ladder to be complete with all its rungs, and they, the angels, are able to ascend. But he's got more on the same theme, sulam, a ladder. The gematria of sulam, 136, is also equal to something else. In fact, it's equal to two other things. Mamon, mamon means what? Money, Money guilt. Mamon and oni. Oni means poverty. So it's interesting. Sulam, a ladder, goes up and down. Money is the same way. Money is at the top, poverty is at the bottom. And a lot of people don't live their whole life in one place. They may go up, they may go down. And certainly, you know, people as a, as a whole are always in flux um, in, between uh, Mamon and Oni. For as it is stated regarding wealth, he lowers this one and he raises that one. Sulam, another approach, a ladder. This word has the same letters as the word semel, idol. Oh, excuse me, it does say, it just doesn't interpret in the same way as I did, as, as Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra says semel as, an, as a symbol. He says semel as an idol. For God showed Jacob a prophecy of his offspring worshipping idols. And that's also a symbol of the ladder, meaning that sometimes your descendants will be on the way up. They will be spiritually um, uh, vigorous and robust and, and uh, on the ascent. Sometimes they'll go down, they go so far down that they'll be bowing down to idols. That was part of the, of the prophecy. Then he goes on further, Behold a ladder. So now he's saying the gematria of the whole phrase. Sulam, we said, is 130 or maybe 136, depending on how you like it. But Vihine Sulam is equal to 196, and that is the same as Vakate in the end. Okay, the next one, Sulam, a ladder. The gematria of this word 130 is equal to that of Sinai. For God showed Jacob his descendants standing at Har Sinai. And then he's got Sulam Mutsav, the gematria of Sulam Mutsav, Mutsav means like uh, standing, is equal to that of Merkavo, his chariot. But he's got more to say. Here's an example of the Masora, the Mas Masoretic uh, like um, tradition, uh, which word Masora means tradition, that records the incidents of certain words where else they appear in the Tanakh. The word mutsav is not such a common word, not so common. It's not like the word uh, uh, sus or har or sadeh that appear hundreds of times. Mutsav is not such a common word, standing. So the Masoretic note says gimel. Mutsav gimel. That's all it says, mutsav gimel. That means to say that the word mutsav appears three times in the Tanakh, in the scriptures. So the first time is here. Then it appears in Alom Mutzav Shebishchem, the plain of the standing stone which was in Shechem. And then you have Vetsarti Alaych Mutzav. So the word Mutzav appears here and in two other places. So he's going to uh, speculate as the significance of that. This implies that God showed Jacob the entry of his descendants into the land of Israel as alluded to by the standing stone which was in Shechem, for this is the first place they conquered when they entered the land of Israel. And the exile also began there, as alluded to in the verse, and will attack you with a standing siege tower. So the word Mutzav, and because we're talking about Yaakov, who embodies the Jewish people, who is on his way into exile, who is on his way to uh, symbolically begin the <clears throat> Odyssey and the drama of the Jewish people in their wanderings throughout history. So this, the Sulan um, embodies all of these or several of these events. The arrival in the land of Israel, which will happen uh, under the leadership of Joshua, and then subsequently the beginning of the exile, and it's all going to be in the same place where the word Mutzav, where the word Mutzav appears in two other places. And finally, Sulam, a ladder. The letters of this word can be arranged to spell Lamas as a tributary, for God hinted to Jacob about the exile. So here we have, let's count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different, quite short comments, really on just one or two, maybe three words. And 
you know, it offers great material for a drasha, for, a, you know, a quiz question and this sort of thing. And he has thousands of these insights in the course of his commentary. You can see why it was so very popular and it's brief as well. Some of them are a bit cryptic, but many of them are easy enough to understand and are, are uh, very, uh, very appealing, very, very inviting. Um, if you turn the page back over, let's just learn a little bit more about his, his life through the brief um, summaries that uh, I've collected. Uh, he left to Germany in 1303 with his father and settled in Barcelona, as we have seen. He moved to a community outside Toledo where his oldest brother, Yechiel, served as a rabbi. He lived in his brother's house. He must have been single at the time. The truth is we know quite little about uh, his personal life. About We know he married. We know he had a son and a daughter. Uh, we don't know much about his descendants, really. Um, as I said, we know about his personal circumstances vis-a-vis -vis poverty. Um, he was presumably single when he lived with his brother in, uh, uh, like in a uh, suburb of Toledo. Uh, his brother Yechiel served as the rabbi. He lived there for a few years until his brother's passing. In 1314, he took up residence with his father and his other brothers, Shlomo, Yehude, el Yakim, and Shimon. In Toledo, throughout these years, Rav Yaakov was unable to earn enough to support his family and constantly had to turn to others for financial assistance. And all of that is implied in that um, passage that we quoted when he said, um, I'm in a situation of someone who can barely get by day, day by day. Should I uh, just uh, continue even on Shabbos that way because I have no means of supporting myself or should I ask for handouts? He served on the Toledo base team, yet despite his poverty, refused to accept a wage for any service that he rendered to the community. So that is a kind of compromised view to say he did serve, but he was still uh, impoverished because he didn't get any uh, payment, which you know, may, may have been his, his uh, circumstance. So we don't know for sure if he really had any formal rabbinic appointment at all. Very little is known about Rabbi Yaakov's marriage and children. He did have at least one son and one daughter. His son, Rav Shlomo, was a modest, God-fearing scholar who passed away in 1349. Rabbi Yaakov's only a few years after his father. Rav Yaakov's daughter is known to have been selfless and tireless in her efforts to support her family so that her husband and sons could dedicate themselves to lifelong Torah study. So they were on the Kolel program before there were any Kololim around. Uh, at some point late in his life, Rav Yaakov left Toledo. Now, this is interesting uh, tradition, difficult to know uh, the reliability of it. It is reported by my friend for the year, Chida. We've mentioned his name a few times. Certainly those who come to Kesher on Shabbos hear his name on my lips frequently. Uh, Chida was one of the great... Um, polymaths of the Jewish world. He died in 1806. He lived in, uh, was born in Jerusalem or in Hebron. He lived between the, the two places, mostly in Hebron actually, but he possibly was born in Jerusalem and he did study in Jerusalem as well. But what's fascinating is that he traveled very widely throughout North Africa, throughout Europe. He was in Italy, he was in London, he was in Versailles, he was in Amsterdam, he was in Frankfurt, he was in Tunis, he was in, uh, in uh, Morocco, he was in Algeria, uh, he traveled very widely. He was uh, on the road officially as a Shadar, that's Shlucha de Rabbanan, he was raising money for the Yeshuv in the land of Israel. But also because he was a brilliant scholar uh, and he had a very I don't want to digress too much to talk about him, but it is pertinent to this little uh, nugget that I want to, to share. He had very wide intellectual horizons. He must have had a photographic memory as well. And I would imagine that the books available to him in Hebron, the Jewish books, he probably read all of them and memorized them all by the time he was a teenager. So he probably wanted to travel partly in order to read new books, to find manuscripts or books that were printed that had not made their way to, to the land of Israel. And he wrote a book called Shem HaGadolim, which is a, a series of biographical sketches of great rabbis, as well as lesser known uh, personalities, and also a, a bibliography where he describes um, many books, possibly most of the Jewish books that were in print in his lifetime, he mentions and he describes them, who wrote them and when they were published and a little bit about them, their influence and that sort of thing. So he collected, he was like a magnet, 
for nuggets of information. Now, he does record a lot of legendary material as well, um, but he was a, a gifted scholar, and he a scholar in the sense that he compared manuscripts, and, and uh, although he was very uh, devout and he was a great follower and admirer of the Kabbalistic tradition, but at the same time he had, the, in terms of scholarship, he had a rationalist component as well to establish what is the accurate version of a story or something like that. So the Chida is the source of a tradition that towards the end of his life, uh, Yaakov Balhaturim, he left Toledo and he wanted to go to the land of Israel and he was on a boat and he got as far as Chios which is in the Aegean Sea. It's not that far from Turkey. And um, he uh, uh, probably stayed there for I don't know how long. And apparently, according to this tradition, he died there. But his remains were sent back to Toledo where he was buried. So he is buried in the family uh, burial section. I don't know whether his grave still remains to this day. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe one could look into that. I'm not sure. Um, may have been trashed by the, crusade, the, the Inquisition and all of that. I question whether it still, uh, still uh, survives to this day. I've got a feeling it does not. Rabbi, yeah. what is the Masoretic sure. Masoretic note? The Masoretic note, so the Masora refers to the precise wording of the words and even the letters in the Torah, including the vowels, the vocalization, the which words are written with a vav or without a vav, what's called yeseros v'chaseros. So that is part of the Masoretic tradition. Um, and we have a tradition about like how many verses are in each parsha in the Torah and how many words are in each parsha and certain other things are part of the Masoretic tradition. And that note that he refers to says that the word mutsav appears in three places. I'm not certain whether the Masoretic tradition includes where the other ones are. Maybe you're supposed to be such a scholar, you look that up yourself. The art school people and others have helped us in that regard. Um, but the Masoretic tradition records a lot of these sort of details. And it reflects uh, absolutely uh, punctilious study on the course of, uh, 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 on the part of probably a generation or more of scholars who counted every word in the Torah and every letter. And uh, this is part of our, of our tradition. And this is why Sifrei Torah are extraordinarily precise and accurate. Uh, I mean, it doesn't mean no, no mistake could ever occur, but because we read our Sifrei Torah publicly, so if there is a mistake, it's much more likely to be, to be identified. So that's the Masoretic uh, tradition. That, so... Um, well, we don't know exactly who. Um, there's someone called um, in Tiberius. They lived in Tiberia, I think in like the 8th or 9th century. And there are two traditions. Uh, Rambam refers to one of them. Uh, I forget the moment which, w but it's the Aleppo Codex. And that, if you've heard of Aleppo Codex, and this, this sort of thing is called Ben... I uh, can't remember at the moment, but we don't know the exact names of the, the individual, but it's an ancient, uh, it's an ancient tradition. That's called the, the, the Masoretic uh, tradition. Just parenthetically, since you mentioned it, Alex uh, Tkesher, I was saying something this past Shabbos about a large Samech in the word Vayahas Kalei Esa'am Al Moshe. And uh, the art scroll, Chumash, if you take a look, it says in the marginal note that it's Samach Gadol. The letter Samach is written large, but the art scroll people didn't print it large. And the Sefer Torah also doesn't have it large. And we did a bit of quick research. Um, and we looked in the Tikkun. It doesn't have it large. The other Tikkun doesn't have it large. This um, Torah Chaim, which is very precise, also does not have it large. And I began to wonder whether there is even such a Masoretic note at all. And it seems this is one of the very few places where it's subject to dispute. That some say there's a tradition of a large Samech, but it seems that it's not that well, um, it's not universally accepted. But that's extraordinary, like the large Dalit in Hashem Echad, or the small Yud in Pinchas, or the broken Vav in Hinin uh, Yino we see Shalom. So there's a Vav there which is broken. That's all part of the Masoretic tradition. So that's what it refers to. 
Uh, yeah, so the uh, Chida records this tradition that he died uh, en route. I find it hard to believe because if he was so impoverished, he couldn't uh, buy kichel and herring for Shabbos. So how is he going to get the uh, fair to, to go you know, to Territ Israel? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but maybe so. Uh, so, yeah, he was laid to rest on the 12th of Tammuz uh, in 1343, although the date, the actual year of his death is, is uncertain. Um, I want to mention as well this ethical will. This is a very interesting book called Hebrew Ethical Wills. Um, it was translated by Israel Abrahams, who I think was here in Jews College uh, 100 years ago or so. It was first published in 1926. And it is an English translation, as I say, kind of uh, from 100 years ago, but translation of a wide range of Hebrew ethical wills of great personalities, some famous, some less famous, uh, where they recorded for their posterity like a, a um, sort of uh, exhortations or values that they would like their descendants or their disciples or their community to aspire to or to live up to. Some of them probably were only intended for actual descendants and others definitely have a wider um, message. So we do have an excerpt from his ethical will here as well, which is quite uh, touching uh, to read, especially when we consider his humility and his poverty, the fact he never had a rabbinic position, and yet he wrote this book, Arba Turim, which is the basis of the Shulchan Aruch, which is of course the basis of Jewish law and practice to this day, and he wrote this commentary, Baal HaTurim, which is so very popular, and uh, his name has been immortalized as a result, so you can just take a look, it's, a, it's an excerpt, there's only two or three pages, if you want to see that as well. well just to finish up, because his work, just reading the last um, little paragraph in the lower right-hand quadrant, because this work is mostly a condensed version of the Ramban's commentary, he's talking here about his Tur Ha'aruch, his uh, full-length commentary on the Torah. He writes, I've not often mentioned the Ramban's name in quoting from this work, for most of my works, for most of my words are his. So I've not mentioned him by name except where the content where the context demanded it. Once again, as is his want in his halachic writings, here too of Yaakov allows his original comments to slip unobtrusively into the work. And you see there his humility, uh, whereas um, another writer might delight in drawing attention to his own novelty or his own uh, brilliance or his own sort of... Um, uh, resolution to a problem that other commentaries have grappled with, or his own contribution to a debate in which many others have put forward their approach, and he'll say, I'd like to suggest my approach as well, or something like that. He doesn't, doesn't do any of that. He almost uh, like hides his identity within the, the, uh, the commentary itself. And really, the Arba Turim also, he's careful to quote all other authorities. I didn't mention, although probably will not come as a surprise to you, that he quotes his father, the Rush, frequently. He quotes the Rambam almost uh, on every occasion, not necessarily to agree with him, but he does very regularly quote the view of the Rambam. He tends to quote his father last, and he tends to um, uphold his father's opinion over that of, of others, which is probably not, not surprising. But in this way, the influence of the rush on halakha also has been um, like uh, brought into the not just the mainstream, but has a prominent voice. And we said the rush, the fa the the mentor of the rush was Maharam Rattenberg. So Maharam Rattenberg, languishing in a German medieval prison in the 13th century, because he taught the rush in prison, even though he was in prison for seven years. Uh, his Talmudim came to learn from him in prison, the Ma Maharam Rottenberg, because the Christian authorities were hoping to ransom him for a lot of money. So that's why they did not mistreat him, because they wanted to um, encourage the Jews to ransom him. He refused to allow them to ransom him. It's an interesting mm -hmm. thing, because he didn't want to encourage the authorities to do the same to other rabbis. It's very interesting. So Maharam Rattenberg was the Rebbe of the Rosh. The Rosh was the father and the mentor of the Rabbi Yaakov Baal HaTurim. And the, the halacha in the tour very frequently follows the Rosh, his father the Rosh. Now it doesn't mean that Rav Yosef Karo and everybody else also agrees with that, but certainly it becomes a very important baseline 
to build the halachic uh, uh, edifice um, upon. So the uh, uh, the Arba Turim, what we call colloquially the tour, uh, very much um, uh, pays uh, t- tribute to the uh, uh, authority of the the father of the author, who is uh, the Rosh. Um, let's just read this last uh, short paragraph. After writing this commentary, Rav Yaakov saw fit to include at the beginning of each weekly sidra condiments such as gematrius and interpretations of Masoretic notes to whet the mind's appetite. Uh, actually, um, I do have a note here in my, in my notes, uh, Aaron. You asked about when did he write these two. It seems that he may have written the, his commentary on the Torah as a younger man, possibly before leaving Germany. So actually, he may have you know, written it uh, before the, the, the major halachic work. Yet it was this series of prefaces to the series that were first printed, originally as a separate volume in Constantinople since year 1514. It was printed actually first in 1500. It was also printed in 1514, but it was already printed in 1500. So you see the popularity of it, and it was reprinted many times again in Venice in 1544. And later as part of most editions of the Chumash, this afterthought to Rav Yaakov's commentary became known as the Balhaturim, and if the number of editions is any indication, one of the most popular Torah commentaries uh, ever written. And as I said, the irony is that the full commentary, to which these little notes were only like um, a teaser and a preface or something like that, um, actually languished uh, in uh, you know, private collections for, for nearly 500 years. Um, so uh, it, it offers great, uh, like, um, I told you, material for drushas and, and for, for clever interpretations. Um, my friend for the year, Chida, he often quotes, without quoting him by name, but he often quotes sort of comments in the style of the Baal HaTurim, and he frequently elaborates further upon it. So if you're clever enough, you can take what the Baal HaTurim tells you and build something uh, you know, further uh, from it. So uh, I would just uh, conclude by saying that uh, Rav Yaakov Baal HaTurim is possibly uh, underappreciated. His influence was vast. And the reason that his influence was so profound is that he was able to bring together the Ashkenazic and the Sephardic traditions, which most most other great Torah commentaries we can think of, including the eight that we've discussed today, they lived in one milieu or the other. Only Ibn Ezra maybe moved a bit between between the two. But in terms of halakhic authorities, if you speak of the Rif, only Sfarad, the Rambam, only Sfarad. you know, uh, Maharam Rottenberg, uh, many of the, the Tosfos, Rashi, not so much halakhic authority, uh, uh, Rashi, but the Tosfos, uh, the Tosfist very much, uh, and many others, they were either in Svarad or Ashkenaz. Balhatun is one of the few who moved from one to the other, and although he lived most of his life in Svarad, but of course he was the disciple of his father, the Rosh. So this gave him his commentary a breadth, and also because one sees his humility, one ex- encounters his humility and the, the uh, willingness and the determination to quote a wide range of authorities, and that made it a solid foundation upon which to build the uh, Shulchan Aruch and the unfolding halachic tradition. I would just like to thank everyone for their uh, participation in this uh, series that we've pursued over the last uh, uh, eight weeks. Hope you found it stimulating and uh, and edifying. I've uh, enjoyed it certainly, and the uh, challenge of preparing the material, hopefully to a uh, standard that meets your satisfaction, has been uh, very rewarding uh, for me as well.